hope this works. Sometimes it's just a little bit slow, so just have patience. So one thing that I will say is this is a, um, it is an interactive presentation. Um, so typically when I'm giving this presentation live, there's a lot of back and forth and, and questions and, and what have you. Um, so at the advice of uh, the guys at the folks at Chase, I've um, incorporated into this uh, menti.com format where you can ask questions or sorry, answer my questions uh, online. So if you look at the very top there, uh, if you can uh, have access to a phone or a tablet uh, and you can get into menti.com and use the code at the top of the presentation. As we go through the presentation, when there's somewhere that I'm gonna ask you to interact, the question will pop up on your phone or device and then you can just throw your answers in there. Um, and we'll kind of go from there. I like to consider myself a, um, a self-proclaimed comedian. So it's gonna be a little difficult not to hear all the laughter at my hilarious jokes. Um, but there is a little heart emoji on the, on the phone app. You can just push that when you think I'm super funny. Um, and hopefully I didn't build up the, <laughs> hopefully I didn't build up too much uh, of, and that I don't overpromise on the interest level of this uh, CEU. Um, also what I wanted to say as I've put uh, out right here is please send me your IDCEC number so we can get it registered and get you your credit. Um, so my email address is greg at infocusinteriorsgroup.ca. I will be getting an attendance list for this um, presentation, but I do need you to send me your IDCEC number so that we can get you credit. So without uh, further ado, let's just kind of move right into it. Sometimes this just goes a little slow if I leave, um, if I leave it on the screen too long. Just give me half a sec. Perfect. So uh, like it was mentioned earlier, uh, my name is Greg Cook, uh, the owner of InFocus Interiors Group. Again, uh, the, it is a, a family owned second generation business. You know, the specific topic of our discussion today is biophilia and biophilic uh, design. I'd like to consider myself an advocate for the topic, um, but not necessarily an expert. And so what I mean by that is I'm gonna do my best to answer any questions as they come up. Um, but if I don't have the answers, I can always get them back to you. You know, the question this presentation answers is pretty, sim uh, pretty simple. And it's why should we incorporate nature into the places that we live and that we work and we play? And in this case, especially we're gonna address work. So I do thank you for joining. Um, and I hope that you find this presentation uh, helpful and entertaining. I will just uh, note that along with um, uh, the Magnuson Group, uh, we partnered with uh, MIST and it, MIST is a consulting um, agency that's based in Chicago that they uh, support healthy and high performance buildings, campuses and cities through design, strategic planning and education. So they were the co-creators of this um, CEU. As you can see here, it's been registered with the Interior Design Continuing Education Council, IDCEC, which means it's accepted by ASID, um, by IIDA, and uh, for our purposes by IDC. Uh, as I had mentioned before, please email me your IDCEC number so we can get you uh, credit for this. Uh, I do have the course code uh, listed up here. If there are any well accredited professionals, so well AP, um, you can self report this CEU um, because you'll get credit for that as well. So if you are a, a well AP, feel free to take that course number and um, report. Come on. Oops. 
Perfect. Okay, so for this presentation, there's gonna be uh, four learning objectives. The first one is just, we're gonna talk about basic concepts um, of biophilia and biophilic design. Uh, then we're gonna see growing body of science-based evidence. Uh, and we're gonna discuss some ways to develop a financial return or a return on investment. And, and then after that, finally, we're gonna talk about some practical strategies as well. This might be one of the most important slides in this presentation. Um, and basically what it is, is if we look at man's time on earth and we compressed it into 24 hours, we've lived in modern cities for less than two minutes. So this isn't really a, a new idea. Um, this presents the important foundation and context for this topic. You know, humans have lived in the natural world for hundreds of thousands of years. We carry this evolutionary imprint in us at a subconscious level, and we're pretty much wired this way um, to be interacting with nature. You know, physically and mentally, we feel and perform best when surrounded by nature. The world is quickly urbanizing. You know, currently 54% 50 of the world's population live in an urban setting, and that's growing about 2% a year. Uh, the, the United Nations predicts that by the year 2030, 60% of the world's population will live in urban um, environments. Therefore, it's imperative that we consider how the human nature connection can still be provided to those residing in towns and in cities. And the answer to this challenge is biophilic design. Sorry about this. Okay, there we go. So first let's understand biophilia. What is it and how do we use it? So we're gonna start with a little exercise. And so this question hopefully has popped up on your device. And I want you to take a moment and think about where's the most relaxing place you've been. We can see some answers starting to pop up here. One of the, <laughs> one of the, uh, one of the things I love best about this program is people actually answer. I don't have to sit there and point at people and drag questions. You just have to type it on your device. So I can see a lot of beach, beach, the lake. I love the bar answer. That's fantastic. A beach in Maui, a beach or in a forest. So you're obviously all getting the point here. Um, is that I would say probably nine out of 10 times what people are thinking about is somewhere outdoors um, and in nature. So then I'll ask you, why do you think you find, why do we find these type of places relaxing? Is that, is that, it's a hard one to think about. <laughs> peaceful peaceful is becoming a, a popular answer so it's peaceful it's green it's quiet you know uh, um, this is fun to watch yeah it's calm you know relaxing um, it's stress-free you're kind of you're kind of away, which is a another option. So here's mine, and and uh, a couple of you actually somebody actually said it. Mine would be, for example, I mean I chose this particular beach. If you recognize it or don't, it's the Black Sand Beach on the road to Hannah in Maui. Uh, two reasons why I have this in the presentation. First is when I got, I got certified to do this presentation, I had just come back 
from Maui. And I wanted to brag to everybody I presented this to that I had just been to Maui. So that was one. Um, another relevant one is this is exactly where I was celebrating my um, 50th birthday on March 13th when the world shut down. Um, and in hindsight, I probably should have just stayed there for the last eight months. But anyways, um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the lush green space, the ocean waves uh, off in the distance, there's some natural blowholes. So it's a, a very relaxing place. And this exactly is what um, biophilia is. I think that's my indicator that I chat too long if, uh, if there's too much of a pause when I'm trying to put on the next one. One thing that I did want to uh, do as, I, I, as I'm, um, I see Danny has his phone up, please feel free to, if I know there's just going to be a recording of this, but if you just want to take a snapshot with your phone of any of these um, slides, feel free to do so. So if we look at the definition of biophilia, you know, bio meaning life, philia meaning having an affinity for, it can roughly translate into life loves life. So if we want to go a little bit further here. So, why there's so much drag. There we go. So it's pretty simple. Biophilia is the interaction between people and nature. So the categories we kind of break it down into is plants, sunlight, water, natural materials, wind, uh, and natural patterns. And when you combine those two together, the outcome is and like an improvement in health and productivity and happiness and creativity and learning, which are all pretty important things for, for people. You know, any opportunity we have to improve things, uh, seeing these sorts of things is definitely uh, worthwhile. So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the term forest bathing. Um, but basically, forest therapy is a research-based framework for supporting healing and wellness through immersion in forests and other natural environments. Uh, forest therapy is inspired by the Japanese practice of Shinrin-yoku, which translates to forest bathing. And really, it's quite simple, and you don't have to overcomplicate it is you just immerse yourself in nature, and you go through a walk from the forest, and you just are able to um, just have the benefit of the multi-sensory uh, actions such as you know seeing or hearing, feeling, smelling, everything to do with uh, nature. Uh, these began in Japan in the mid 1980s. It's what now a cornerstone of preventative health care and healing in Japanese medicine. And its benefits have been proven to boost immunity, uh, reduce stress, reduce blood pressure, uh, up to 5% in an hour and improve your mood. I'm going to read a little snippet from a book called The Nature Fix by Florence Williams. And it says, to prove that our physiology responds to different habitats, uh, Miyazaki's taken hundreds of research subjects into the woods since 2004. He and his colleague, Ju Young Lee, found that leisurely, walk, leisurely forest walks compared to urban walks delivered a 12% decrease in cortisol levels. But that wasn't all. They recorded a 7% decrease in sympathetic nerve activity, a 1.4% decrease in blood pressure, and a 6% decrease in heart rate. On psychology questionnaires, they also report better moods and lower anxiety. So increasingly companies are creating where possible or, uh, or relocating to give employees easy access to natural areas like this. Think about it, work stress alone and, and, and understand this is a US um, created CEU, but in the US work related stress alone accounts for uh, $190 billion in healthcare costs every year. So, can anyone identify these two structures? Let me 
just check. So far, have I stumped you? Apple on the left, Apple, Apple, everyone's got that. Oh, and there we have Apple and Amazon is correct. Yeah. So on the left, we have Apple's headquarter. You know, Steve Jobs' plan was to have 80% of the property um, landscaped with 6,000 trees. And when they were done, um, um, when they were done the area, they had closer to 9,000 trees on that property. As far as Amazon goes, they're in these um, uh, globes or bubbles, there's 450 species of plants. There, it, it would include waterfalls, a river, a five-story living wall, and treehouse-like spaces. It's kept at 72 degrees and 60% relative humidity, which is ideal for both plants and humans, at a cost of nearly $300 million. This was originally planned to be a six-story building, just of more offices, but Amazon recognizes the need for a place for our people to feel and think differently. Um, and you know whatever you say about Apple and Amazon, they are financially driven companies, and and they can obviously see that there is a financial return on these big investments. So that's just a photo of what Greg does to get his forest bathing in is just hop on a bike and get into uh, get into nature. So here's. Here's another uh, important slide, and it's kind of really why we're here, is uh, there have been thousands of scientific studies done on this topic. Um, they reflect proven physiological and psychological benefits uh, where we can measure the impact of improved health. And we can translate these proven measures into financial implications. So if I just read a... Um, an excerpt from The Healthy Workplace by Leah Stringer in a report called The Economics of Biophilia, Terrapin Bright Green, an environmental consulting firm, claims over the last quarter century, case studies have documented the advantage of biophilic experience, including improved stress recovery rates, low blood, pre blood pressure, improved cognitive functions, enhanced mental stamina and focus, decreased violence and criminal activity, and elevated moods and increased learning rates. So you can see on this um, chart here, stuff like patient recovery time reduced by 9% or creativity increased by 15% or test scores improved by 18% and crime reduced by um, uh, 7%. And we're gonna discuss workplace productivity improvements um, in a few minutes. So a subset of uh, biophilia is biophilic design, and that's incorporating natural elements into man-made design uh, and a response to the human need to be connected with nature. So if you see here, it's basically taking, you know, our, our cities and our buildings and our material products and then combining them with uh, plants and water and wind and air and light and space and materials and patterns, kind of the six categories that we're gonna focus on. And this isn't really new. I mean, years ago, if you think about it, and I'm talking years ago, uh, buildings and spaces were biophilic by nature, where we started off in caves, you know, and as that technology advanced, uh, we closed up our buildings so that we can control the environment. You know, we've got AC, we've got windows, and we're kind of determining the, the wealth and comfort and in a little bit of a way, our progress has, has not been our friend, but today's increasing health and wellness movement represents a rollback to how we've been designing our buildings. Oh, sorry. One, two, quick. So these are the six categories for simplicity. Like I just mentioned, uh, there's plants, there's waters, there's air and temperature, you know, uh, meaning the faint shifts in temperature and airflow so that you, you feel like you're outdoors. Um, there's materials and patterns, space and form, and then light and shadow. And when we isolate nature's characteristics and study the effects of each, 
we can create tools for designers to use in creating healthy and beautiful workspaces. You know, we're really good at grids and rectangles because they're efficient, but biophilic design can break down these grids into uh, natural patterns. So here's your next question, is what improvements could be made to these spaces to make them more biophilic? Or more importantly, what do you see or not see that is, uh, is in these spaces? We've got plants, windows, planters, flowers. Got a lot, a lot of plant life. Uh, Access to natural views, windows, awesome. So pretty much, I mean, if we go back to the, the slide before, it's the six categories of plants, water, air and temperature, uh, materials and patterns uh, to show nature um, and light and shadow. You know, healthcare has kind of probably been at this the longest as, as far as biophilic design with uh, measurable improvements in accelerating patient healing. Um, plus where stress and fear and anxiety is a is everyday occurrence. So if you look at the, at the images on the screen here, we've got like a sensory and healing gardens that have proven to reduce stress, anxiety and calm uh, chemical imbalances in patients. We've got uh, just images of nature within a hospital room when you don't have the ability to get images of nature. Um, and then on the right there is a photo of the Ann and Robert uh, Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. To dive a little deeper into, into that one, um, this is the Crown Sky um, Garden at that hospital. And it may as well be a promotional piece for uh, biophilic design. So there's lots of glass that's going to allow a bunch of daylight to come in um, and make you feel like you're kind of outside in all seasons. Uh, edge at, at the edges of the sky garden, uh, they've got bamboo, uh, mountain, far, uh, sorry, marble fountains, uh, and it frames the views of the city as well. This was a big investment that they made. Um, knowing that it was important to both the staff, the patients, and the families. I mean, this could have easily just been a couple more floors of patient rooms. Uh, another example, this would be in uh, the Children's Hospital in Seattle, but I can also tell you if, if you haven't been into it, it's a very similar feel to what we've done for our Children's Hospital here in Vancouver, and it's uh, environmental references and graphics for wayfinding. Um, and these are how they refer to the different wings of the hospital. You know, it's uh, a kind of adds, having the animals and the landscapes uh, natural to the Pacific Northwest, Northwest, it adds more of a calming presence. It's so much better to tell a child that we're gonna take you to the ocean today instead of saying, we're gonna go down to urgent care. Uh, you know, phone and, and faux nature, a little uh, pun is that faux nature is better than no nature as well. So you will see effects of, positive effects of having images of um, nature um, than having no, no nature at all. So just some more uh, examples of biophilic spaces beyond healthcare. Um, uh, I didn't put this one out to, to everybody to tell me what they recognize here. So I'll just give you all the answers, which I'm sure you already know. You know, we've got the Sydney Opera House. We've also got, um, if you can see on the far left, the Anazazi Ruins um, from New Mexico. That's the High Line from New York City. There's just hospital rooms with um, natural views. And then also like carpet tile that have um, natural patterns in them. So you can see the look of water and, and grass and uh, dirt paths and stuff like that. All ways to kind of add nature 
or um, visuals to a space. You know, biophilic design can be pretty much anything and, and can be anywhere. So the first thing I'm gonna say is don't try to read this. Um, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't try to read this. It just simply reflects the mounting body of evidence in measuring the various positive effects and benefits of biophilia and biophilic design. Um, if you could read this or read some of these, and I have read some of them, um, and so I will tell you that it's not the easiest reads. It may remind you of being in stats class if you ever took stats. Um, but you learn stuff like, you know, morning sunlight reduces the length of hospitalization in bipolar depression. Uh, the value of trees, water, and open space is reflected by house prices. The impact of workplace daylight exposure on sleep, physical activity, and quality of life, and the uh, physiological effects of forest bathing. They're all discussed here. I've got a couple studies here, which uh, I have read. This is the economics of biophilia. Um, what you would learn in this one is that 10% of employees' absences can be attributed to architecture with no connection to nature. Uh, children progress through school curricula 20 to 26% faster when they're learning in a day-lit environment. And people will pay about 127% more for a property with a view to water. Uh, if we look at the global impact of biophilic design in the workplace, which is another one of the studies on this list, 33% of all respondents said that the design of an office would affect their decision to work for a particular company. The natural light is the most sought uh, after element within the workplace, yet globally 47% of offices have no natural light and 58% of offices have no plants. They went on to further talk about regional uh, aspects and you know, Australia had a need for or a want to have wood in the office place, uh, whether it's in their flooring or their desks or their paneling. Uh, India, Indonesia and Germany liked green office colors uh, Canada had a preference to greenery in the office space. And then if we dive a little bit more into the Canadian perspective, the availability of external green space was linked to greater happiness at work. Also, the color purple was a predictive of employee happiness, which means we should just paint all our offices purple and fill them with plants and everyone's going to be happy. This is when you can hit the hearts. <laughs> Uh, window views to trees were associated with greater levels of creativity and uh, having plants in the office was linked to greater levels of productivity among workers. So that's just some of, uh, some of the studies that, uh, that you can find, um, but there's a, a ton of them out there. I'm not sure why I now have three blue lines over my presentation. I apologize for that. <laughs> I didn't know I could draw on these, but anyways. <clears throat> so the same body of evidence is the catalyst for the current health and wellness trend. Uh, the new and international well building, which I discussed earlier, um, seeks to promote improved health and wellness across the workforce. Um, so what lead is to buildings, if you're not familiar with lead is to buildings, well is to the people of the buildings. So well considers kind of air and water and nourishment, light, fitness, comfort, and mind, which sounds a little bit familiar with what we're talking about here today. And biophilic design plays a big part in that. <clears throat> Here's an interesting slide. Um, that a lot of people usually snap a picture of. Um, so if you, if you would like to go ahead, these are just, um, and it's more of a close to home example of research. It's well documented that indoor plants improve air quality by removing toxins from the air we breathe. So here's a list of 18 plants that do the best job of this. Uh, and this was according to NASA research. Um, so why would it be done by NASA research? It's because they were trying to find out what was the best products to put up into their space station, space station to help clean the air. 
when the astronauts were there. You know, these are excellent houseplants that you could probably even purchase. Um, I won't say on your way home because we're all home, but uh, just go out and grab a couple of these, snap a picture and know that they're, they've been uh, known as the 18 best to clean up the, um, the air quality. <clears throat> so, uh, we have established that biophilic design is the theory, the science and the practice of creating buildings inspired by nature with the aim to continue the individual's connection with nature and the environment in which we live and work every day. But now let's focus on biophilic design within the workplace. And in particular, I'm going to talk about the office workplace. So what does a biophilic workplace look like? It can look a lot of different ways. Um, I'm sure you recognize some of these pictures here. We've got the Harper uh, Memorial, uh, Memorial Library in Chicago. Obviously on the right, which usually everybody knows, is the Frank Lloyd Wright's Johnson Wax and Men Building in Wisconsin. And then we've even got some more photos of carpet tiles. You know, there's no real single style or layout or design that, that is requi required for biophilic design. And that's kind of the exact point. You don't really need to be a Frank Lloyd Wright to do it. Um, if you do look at the image of the Johnson um, of the Johnson Wax and Min Wax and Min building, you know you're going to see inclusions of large plants within there, uh, all the natural patterns, the columns and the ceiling structures mimicking a tree canopy. I've had others describe it as it looks like lily pads, um, and then the light coming through the top. There's not many hard edges, and the color palette is or colors that you'll find in, um, that you'll find in nature. Perfect. So next question, what features make this space biophilic? So we've got the setting, the views, the colors, the plants, natural light. So we've got the um, adjustable daylight, the views of nature, the natural materials, the indoor plants. I'm glad that you've all been paying attention to the presentation so far, because I think you got 100% between all of you. So thank you for that. This is going to show um, where Greg's a little bit techno mute and kind of gave the answer away for this, because couldn't quite get the right slide inserted in here. So is this a biophilic workspace? Obviously, with the big X through the middle. <laughs> Um, the answer is is no. Um, so, but but why not? And, and honestly, it's because let me just check here. There's always a yes. Um, <clears throat> it's it's way too much. It's it comes across as chaotic and not composed, and it creates stress. Yes, it is green in nature, but our brains perceive a difference between them. So it does not create us, it does not get us in, get us the desired result from it. Uh, you know, in this case, sometimes less can be more uh, and you need to be able to strike a balance. And that's the key to, um, to good design. So we're gonna talk about the, um, the economic case for a biophilic workplace, which centers on productivity. And the office productivity is the, primarily about the workforce. And the workforce is made up of the people, human beings that are wired with the need for nature. Um, so productivity is kind of defined as you see on the slide here as uh, the number of goods and service produced divided by the cost, which is your time and resources to produce them. Um, 
our primary factors that adversely affect worker productivity in today's companies are absenteeism, is when you're physically not there. Um, presenteeism, which I can say there's a strong case which is extremely prominent in this, this in, in the last eight months or so, where you're physically there, but you're mentally disengaged. Um, and then we have staff turnover and retention. Um, so both um, physiologically measured, which is the real and the perceived, which is psychologically measured and how they both affect productivity. Um, and here's something important to note that because the workforce is made up of people, when it comes to worker productivity, both real and perceived fac factors affect this. So how workers feel both mentally and um, physically are a big part of productivity. Uh, I'm gonna read you a little snippet from The Healthy Workplace from, uh, again, from, from Leah Stringer. In two studies of office workers, Leah Heshong, an architect and researcher specialized, specializing in the impact of daylighting on human performance, found that those with full window views, especially views of nature, performed better on a number of work tasks. One of the studies conducted in a call center found that workers with window views performed six to 7% faster and were able to handle more calls than those without window views. In her second study, a field experiment, she found a positive correlation between window views and computerized memory and attention tasks. Furthermore, the quality of the view mattered. Those with high with full high quality views of natural vegetation performed 10 to 25% better on these tasks than those with a limited or an artificial view. Another example of the importance of daylight and views is a study of an office building in the university, uh, at the University of Oregon. 30% of office space in the building overlooked trees and manu manu manicured landscape. 31% of the office space overlooked a street building and a parking lot, and 39% of the offices were on the interior of the building and had no outside view at all. Occupants with views of trees and landscape took an average of 57 hours of sick leave per year compared with 68 hours per year of sick leave taken by employees with no view at all. <clears throat> so it's, it's important to realize that perception matters. Um, the human space report is a, is a great one if you're interested in reading more about it. Uh, and this was just a high level summary of results of a study of 7,600 office workers around the world um, that is related directly to green space in the workspace, green space in the workplace, sorry. And specifically, it's about a worker's emotional state upon entering their workplace. So the researchers asked some simple questions about each person's perception as they entered an interior workplace with green space and without green space. And there was, the results were basically this, that the people had more positive feelings entering a workspace with greenery and they had less negative feelings entering a workspace with greenery. So people or the workers are biased immediately upon walking in the door. And how we start our day is important. It matters in the quality of our work and it lasts throughout the day. <clears throat> so I'm gonna dive into one study to illustrate these concepts. This is the relative benefits of green versus lean office space. I don't know if you're familiar with that, um, but they did three uh, field experiments. One was a hoteling study where they did pre and post survey over three months with 166 workers. The second was a, a study at a call center where they um, studied measurable productivity over three months. And then a third was an analytical tasks, one-time test for 35 people. And researchers conducted side-by-side -side experiments in two different environments. One in a green office 
and one was in a lean office. So in the green office, they added potted plants. And in the lean office, they had no greenery. And they were asked to do the exact same tasks. And the only difference was green versus lean. And the measurements were taken um, from, these, from these four, uh, or from these four areas. So they were measuring um, actual measured productivity, uh, perceived satisfaction, perceived air quality, and perceived concentration. And simply by um, adding or removing these potted plants. So uh, here's what the results were, is in their measured productivity, it increased six to 15%. In their perceived um, air quality, it went up five to 10%. Their perceived concentration went up five to 10%, and their perceived satisfaction went up 5% in the offices that had the, uh, the, green, the greenery in it. So there was a positive impact on the worker, both measured and perceived, which is important here. To read a bit from this study, a consistent pattern emerged whereby workers in green workspace had a more positive orientation to their work environment and to their work than those in lean workspaces. That is enriching a previously lean office with plants served to significantly increase workspace satisfaction, self-reported levels of concentration and perceived air quality. So crucially enriching space also improved perceived productivity in study one and actual productivity in study three. A green working environment is consistently more enjoyable for employees, more conductive to concentration and more productive for the business than its lean, equi than its lean equivalent. Indeed, simple enriching a previously Spartan space with plants served to increase productivity by up to 15% a figure that aligns closely with the findings in previously conducted uh, laboratory um, findings. So to take an, uh, take an example, kind of how do we translate these benefits into a workplace value proposition? So for an example, let's take a, a service-based company, i.e. Um, uh, independent rep agency like myself, a design firm like some of you, where your typical operating costs, 90% of those costs are going to be your staff and your benefits, and 10% of your costs are going to be your um, operating costs. So you can tell that the efficiency of gains of, of your, from your staff will dwarf any savings that you can get on your um, operating costs. You know, this, if you increase the efficiency of your staff by 5% versus increasing the efficiency of your operating costs, it's gonna be a much more noticeable difference on what you can do for your staff. Also not to mention what a 6% productivity gain could mean for uh, revenue. So if we just go back a couple slides to where we showed the measured, or measured productivity can be increased from six to 15%. And we take the, the bare minimum at 6%. So let's say that you have $20 million annual revenue um, and you're able to increase that by 6%. That leads to a $1.2 million increase um, in your revenues based on increase of your productivity. Um, which is not really a bad return on investment for making a small investment in putting greenery in your office space. So what if you don't believe this hard dollar exercise, even though the research has proven it to be true? You need to ask, what is the soft but the real value to an organization of improving its employees' perceived happiness, well-being, and satisfaction? What is the value to a company of increasing positive energy, working relationships, teamwork, collaboration, and, equip and commitment? Reducing your absenteeism, reducing your presenteeism, uh, reducing your turnover, and your lost productivity for retraining costs. Um, and just overall showing your workforce that, that you care. 
so there is big potential. I know we showed this slide earlier in biophilic design, uh, given the proven positive effects that it does have on people uh, and in any possible way you want to test and, and measure it. So now let's look what we can do with this and what are some of the practical strategies um, that, um, that we can work with. <clears throat> so here are some strategies for new projects uh, organized by the six kind of categories that we've been discussing. Seems a little bit cut off there. Um, but some of the examples that we can have is access to terraces with indoor outdoor spaces, views of water outside, access to outdoor air and wind via operable, operable windows and doors, daylight via windows, glass doors or an open office, maybe some space spaces shaped to allow a sense of mystery when moving through, um, through, which is one of my favorite ones and interesting, but also just digital screens with images of nature, uh, you know, with all those TVs that, that we have out there, having uh, a resting TV with an image of nature can be a benefit. <clears throat> so the question is, what if you don't have a major project going on? Are there still things you can do? And obviously the answer is yes. Uh, there's 15 strategies left here that are, are lower cost and a faster action. Um, you know, examples such as small desktop plants, indoor water features, uh, ability to control daylight via blinds, um, a non-repetitive workspace layouts exhibiting orderly um, variation. So to sum it up, um, to, uh, to, to sum it up here are kind of five of the top, um, the top five practical strategies, uh, the most focused, the most bang for your buck, um, um, and some of the easiest to implement. So what's next? If you're still interested at this point, and I hope that you are, what are some of the steps that you can take? <clears throat> First is you can kind of learn more. Uh, I don't even think we've scratched the surface today in, in, in the topic. Um, there's lots of suggestions. Uh, I referred to a few of these um, different studies here. Uh, you can review the well building standard. Um, the economics of biophilia, which we discussed, the theory, the science and practice of bringing buildings to life. You can uh, just go in and Google biophilic design. It's, uh, it's what is what I did when I was getting certified for this. And there's just tons and tons of information, including TED Talks on the subject. But probably the, the easiest thing to do is just try it for yourself. Like go out for a walk, completely disconnect, it may be a struggle, but leave that phone behind and kind of just get out into nature and kind of just absorb it all. And then who can leverage from these benefits? I mean, there's a, a whole list up here, space planners, designers, architects, uh, owners, um, product companies, pretty much anyone and everyone at work and at home. Uh, with colleagues uh, and your families, you know we're all we're all human. We're all wired with the need for nature, and pretty much just awaiting the many the many benefits uh, that we can get from it. So, so just to kind of review some of our learning objectives, objectives is uh, we talked about our basic concepts of biophilia and biophilic design. I went through some of the growing body of science-based evidence. Uh, we discussed uh, some ways to develop a financial return or get a return on investment, and then talked about some practical strategies. So I hope that I was able to achieve this and address these subjects for you. Um, and at least that would be a start for you today. Um, I do want to thank you for your time this does officially conclude the CEU portion of the presentation. Um, I don't want to keep you much longer. I've got a couple minutes. So I will just tell you a little bit about um, 
the Magnuson Group, which along with the MIST Consulting Agency created uh, this CEU. Um, as uh, we had indicated before, I am an independent rep. I rep um, six different furniture manufacturers, and then I also rep um, a commercial flooring line, uh, Tarquette uh, Commercial Flooring. I handle all the resilient side of that business. Um, but as far as my furniture line goes, the Magnuson Group, was, which uh, hopefully most of you have heard of, um, but if not, I'll just give you a brief little overview on them. Uh, Magnuson is, it's a fourth generation family owned business. It's in, based in Chicago. They manufacture in Chicago and in Europe. Uh, we do ancillary and support furnishings. So we're not the furniture, but the furnishings is, uh, is how we market it. Um, And one of our fastest growing categories, which ties into the topic of biophilic design is our planters. Uh, we do planters for both indoors and outdoors. Um, and it's no real surprise that this is our fastest growing category. So just to talk about a couple of the products here, um, we have our Cascade series, which is a painted steel indoor um, planter in varying heights and varying shapes. We can use them for a variety of different reasons. You can use them for space division. We can use them to just frame seating areas. Um, we do, um, like I said, a variety of different heights, 12, 18, 36 inch, I believe 20 inch. We use it for seat dividing. You can put it in, in entry areas. So with all those different shapes, you can create a whole bunch of different visuals. Uh, we discussed and talked about the importance of uh, having the greenery of the entrance of a workspace and how it can set the worker's mood for the day. This would be a, a picture of our showroom in Chicago at the Merchandise Mart at uh, Neocon. If anybody has been into um, our, our suite there, um, we, do, we do quite a bit of greenery to, to show the benefits of it. This is a product called Decapo that is actually a literature rack that we hang off the walls, um, but we can use that in a, a situation to add greenery to the workspace as well. Uh, green cloud on the left is a floor, uh, like we can put it on a stand or we can mount it from the ceiling. Um, so two different versions what we can do with green cloud. And then this would be our um, pick series. And we do this both in a waste receptacle. Waste receptacles is the biggest portion of our, our business, but, um, uh, or we have a matching planter as well. So again, I didn't want to keep you too long, but uh, did want to touch on a couple of the products. Um, I do want to thank you for your time today. I'm just going to stop and share and just chat here. I'm just going to quickly go through this. Please write in the email. Greg didn't quite get that. I've got all the questions here, Greg. I can go through them. There was only, a, I got one question sent to me directly. Uh, where's a good, place to go uh, locally here in British Columbia for actually uh, getting and maintaining the plants? Um, oh, I would, I would probably first would um, throw out uh, Art and Apps is a, is a popular one or Arts and, and Self. Um, I used to be involved in, in kind of that through a, an indirect way. So I know a bit about that. I mean, I live out in Langley and there's an abundance of um, uh, um, nurseries out there um, that, that uh, have a wide selection, um, specifically triple A arts, uh, arts itself, like I said, art and naps. So uh, they know, so they know, Greg, when, when, we're, when we're talking about indoor plants and maintaining indoor plants, they, they, have, a, they have an understanding about this topic? For sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. for that. sure I do. Uh, I. Um, um, 
uh, well, I'll just say my ex-wife used to work at Arts Nursery uh, at the time. And so I'm very familiar with the staff there and the knowledge of, of their products there. And yes, they definitely would be extremely knowledgeable um, as, as, long as, as far as that goes. Thanks, Greg. It looks like someone else has also shared uh, Ambius Vancouver is a good supplier. Thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing that. And Annie sent a, a link to Ambius. That's great. Perfect. They actually, I, I know that the question has been both where are you going to get the plants, but they're probably more important. How are you going to maintain them? But it looks like uh, that could be a, a solution for both. That's great. Any other questions from the group? Please remember to uh, send me your number, your IDCEC number, so I can get that um, registered and you can get your credit for spending the hour with me. Great. Appreciate everyone for coming. Again, our, our events are located on our website. We do two a month, and we'll, our next one's going to be Kiss the Frog on January 14th. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Have a great yeah. holiday.